being here, um, it's a great pleasure and honor to introduce Professor Ifan Ahmed, who's an anthropologist and senior lecturer in the School of Political and Social Inquiry at Monash University in Australia. He is the 2009 author of Islamism and Democracy in India, The Transformation of the Jamaati Islami, um, brought up by the uh, brought up by Princeton University Press, which was shortlisted for the 2011 International Convention of Asian Scholars Book Prize for the best study in the social sciences, um, including, uh, he also has a number of, of articles that have appeared in Anthropological Theory, um, Citizenship Studies, the Journal of the Royal Anthropological Institute, and Modern Asian Studies. He is a contributor to the Princeton Encyclopedia of Islamic Political Thought. Um, and he is on the editorial committee of the journal South Asia and, and is the associate editor of Islam and Christian Muslim Relations. Yeah, it is a strange name. <laughs> uh, currently, he is writing a book manuscript on critique and Islam, of which this presentation is a part. Today's talk is entitled Toward an Anth Anthropology of Critique Secular, Religious, Imminent, Transcendental. So join me in welcoming Professor Ahmed. So, <clears throat> this is working, right? Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you to all of you for coming here, and especially to Muzaffar Saab, uh, who made this visit possible, to Purnima and a lot of other people who were uh, involved in getting me here. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. So, what I will do is, <coughs> basically this talk would be in three parts. In first part, I will make a commentary on the received wisdom on the issue of critique and Islam. And in the second part, I will lay out my argument, which consists of four connected propositions. And in the final part, I will give some illustration of historical ethnographic nature. And I don't have a conclusion, so uh, it is entirely up to you to conclude the way you want. So <coughs> let me start with uh, a story from New York Times. Uh, is my accent very strange, or you can follow it? No, okay. okay. <laughs> On 10 11 2006, New York Times published a long story titled, Across Europe, Worries on Islam is Spread to Center. As it is common with such a stories, it covered many aspects. I have chosen the theme of criticism this story deals with. The first sentence concluded as follows, quote, more people in the mainstream are arguing that Islam cannot be reconciled with European values. The next sentence is a quote from Patrick Gonman, owner of a funky wine bar in Antwerp, Belgium. And here is the quote. You saw what happened with Pope Benedict XVI. He said Islam is an aggressive religion, and the next day Muslims kill a nun somewhere to make his point. Rationality is gone. End of quote. Mr. Gorman is described in the news story as hardly an extremist. Rather, he is sympathetic to Muslims because a week earlier, he and his friends had organized, uh, shut down their restaurants in protest against an anti-Muslim rally taken out by a far-right Belgium party. The story then moves on to another quote by J Jack Estraw, the British Foreign Secretary, and a quote from him saying that 
how veiling was a visible statement of separation and difference. The next paragraph refer back to Pope's speech calling Islam evil and inhuman to say while Muslim berated him, non-Muslims applauded him for bravely speaking a hard truth. The story further progressed to say how Muslims lack of rationality towards comments such as Pope's showed Europe's limits of tolerance and the fear that any critique of Islam could provoke violence. To this end, it cited some cases. In France, for instance, a school teacher went underground after he received death threats for calling the Prophet Muhammad a merciless warlord, a looter, a mass murderer of Jews, and a polygamist. The story also referred to Muslim protest against the Danish cartoon as a sign of hostility to free speech. A Belgian woman married to a Tunisian man was quoted to say, no explanation about free speech could convince her husband that publication of cartoons lampooning Muhammad was in any way justified. New York Times portrayed the issue in binary terms, freedom-loving, enlightened, reason-driven Europe against an uncritical, begotted, freedom-despising Islam. While Goneman, a secular funky bar owner, fought for Muslims, the Tunisian man had no idea of freedom of speech regarding the publication of Prophet's cartoons. While the Pope bravely spoke a hard truth, Muslim had no intellectual capacity to respond to it but to kill a nun. Thus, their story consolidated secular and critical as homologous, and Islam and critique as mutually hostile and foreign to one another. Recall Mr. Gorman say, rationality is gone. In short, New York Times established a chain of equivalence amongst Islam, violence, veiling, separation, and Muslims' lack of criticality. This equation of Islam with the absence of critique has a longer genealogy in Western thought. However, its reassertion in the 20th century dates to the end of Cold War, which Fucking Heiner calls it zero year for the envisioning of a new global order. And primarily it was reflected in, in the Rushdi affair. I don't want to be misunderstood as saying that either religion or Islam was absent during the Cold War. Far from it. The very term Cold War is linked to Islam. Also, Cold War was not that secular. It was religious too. Christian democracy versus godless communism. It is relevant to note that Huntington's class of civilization phrase was used as far back as in 1964 by Bernard Lewis. In fact, in 1953 itself, he had identified Cold War with Islam, as Bernard Russell had done, lightning Bolsheviks with the successors of Muhammad, as he called them. Yet, watershed was the Rushdie affair on which much has been written. My aim is to pick the issue of rationality and critique. Some argued that Christianity of enlightenment with its self-reflexivity, tolerance, and freedom clashed with Islam's sheer lack thereof. Terming Christianity as a house with many, with many living quarters, Margaret Atwood argued that Christianity is supposed to include critique as inherent feature, whereas Muslims protest showed its utter absence. Likewise, Sadiq Alazm wrote that Rushdie affair brought Uh, Rushdie affair brought hitherto untouchable subjects within the compass of critical thought and autonomous reason. He concluded his essay on what he called 
Rushdie's explosive intervention with a call, and there is a quote from him, we desperately need the two great arts of the modern world, reason and revolution. In 2009, and I will stick with Rushdie for a while here, uh, in 2009, New York University organized a conversation between Irshad Manji and Sir Salman Rushdie. Manji asked, why do you think the controversy over satanic verses continues to be so intense? Sir Rushdie said, the most important reason is what I call, and this is his word, uh, the argument about who had control over the story. Free society argues about, disputes, tells, and retells, and changes its own story. In contrast, in an unfree society, you are not allowed to do that, in which somebody tells. Not only I tell the story, but I tell you what it means. Because I was trying to do something else, Rushdie continued, they came after me. So leaving aside, if there is a story without a community of listeners and Rushdie's silence about it, let me say that a perceptive observer knows well the limits a free society also imposes on what to tell and how to tell a particular story. And therefore, this watertight, very Popperian definition between free and unfree society that Rushdie rehearsed in 2009 uh, seems very problematic. Uh, a pertinent example of this is the trajectory of the current project that I am following. I presented this idea of critique and Islam in many venues, and I faced uh, a stiff opposition to the idea that Islamic tradition has its own mo mode of critique. Uh, its most eloquent expression came in the form of editorial rejection of the proposal for a special issue I submitted to a journal called Thesis 11. I'm not sure how many of you know that journal. Uh, the journal rejected the proposal, and this was based on the conference papers that I had organized in, in Holland. But the interesting point is the reason for this rejection, and, and, and I will quote uh, the note of rejection. It said, any discussion of imminent critique in Islam must first confront the failure of the Islamic world over the last three centuries to translate imminent critique into a process of reformation, end of quote. Uh, I found the response very curious, showing as it did how free the free society is that Islam historically did not have, and therefore it must have a reformation, is a story that has immense appeal among many. This lack of Islam, and to use Gunter Grasse's probing word, the simultaneous luck of Europe to enact reformation and enlightenment. So the polarization here is lack versus luck. Uh, so this kind of positing of argument cuts across the divides in such a way that it becomes central to the views of figures as diverse as British writer William Blunt, Gunter Grass, even you know Berlusconi, the Italian Prime Minister, Habermas, and of course Rushdie. So <clears throat> this, in some ways, I'm trying to capture uh, the dominant framework of looking at the issue of uh, critique, reason, and Islam. Now, a number of issues are at, at a stake in thinking about the alleged lack of critique in Islam. In my view, <coughs> the meaningful question is not Islam's putative absence of critique. Rather, it is about the inability of our existing frameworks to recognize and appreciate the principles and practices of critique already at work in Islam. And perhaps the greatest inability of the framework is the Enlightenment legacy according to which 
critique is understood by and large as critique of religion not critique from or critique within religion and this is an important point that I want to stress. Thus in contribution to the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right Marx wrote the criticism of religion is the premise of all criticism. However, such a view is not limited to Marxist. Others too share this view due to the related premise that whereas other religions have become or are likely to get secularized, Islam is the most stubborn religious tradition to the process of secularization. So this is one of the arguments that Gellner uh, the anthropologist met. And because of such a premise, it is assumed that Islam can never be an agent and source of critique. It can only be an object of critique. Uh, among others, Muhammad Arkun's writing is one among several examples. Contemporary new atheism also displays this very distinctly enlightenment view of religion, especially Islam. In particular, one can think of uh, Christopher Hitchens and the French atheist Michel Onfray. For such atheist and secularist, Islam is not a religion. In fact, it is the religion. Indeed, in many current writings, Islam is presented as most religion, most religious religion of all. And one example would be uh, Benjamin Barber's book called Jihad versus Macworld, where he uses jihad as a shorthand for what he describes uh, as atavistic politics uh, in general, yet its evocative power ultimately rests in Islam, which he calls as the essential locus of jihad. So against this kind of background, I make four connected arguments. And my first argument is critique in different forms and modalities has been integral to Islam. Western notion of critique is tied to a distinct historical formation, the generalization of which has limited use in other contexts against the doxa which views Islam and critique as exclusive and therefore Islam and critique, I propose we begin to think of Islam as critique. My position is thus neither of incommensurability. I find this word very difficult to pronounce. Uh, so my position is neither of incommensurability nor of isomorphism between the two and I'm um, in favor of dialogue and comparison between them, recognizing very well that each has a different trajectory and each is enmeshed in a distinct tradition. My second proposition is that in and of itself, reason is neither sufficient nor always desirable. Reason, unaided, delinked, unhooked, isolated, autonomous, it rarely exists. Left to itself, seldom can it comprehend the first principle any tradition worldview, including the secular one, presupposes. Thus, Jeremy Bentham, J.S. Mill, and Henry Sidgwick, for instance, held that the maximization of pleasure and happiness is the main driver of human action. Once a person accepts this first principle, reason can be harnessed to pursue this goal. However, reason in itself can seldom explain that pursuit of pleasure is the only driver of human action. Importantly, there are other, view, other worldviews different from utilitarianism. Uh, one example would be uh, the Amish who do not valorize pleasure, for instance. In fact, vanity, violence, makeup, jewelry, music, 
entertainment, premarital sex, camera, to name a few, are considered distractions from the worldview Amish claim to follow. On what basis, therefore, can one say that Amish worldview is against reason? On the contrary, their worldview and the desire to live their religion, and this is an important phrase, I like it, uh, unmolested by the state. So the desire to live their religion unmolested by the state uh, is perfectly reasonable as long as one doesn't denounce the first principles, first principle that Amish hold. It thus follows that it is not enough to say that a person is critical. It is also significant to see what drives the project of her critique. Returning to Rushdie affair, it is important to ask, what was the goal of Rushdie's critique? Did Rushdie criticize Islam, as Ziauddin Sardar observed, to destroy Islam? In contrast, is Sardar's own critique of Rushdie and his work of critique as an example of what he calls to reform and change Muslim behavior and the understanding of Islam? If the equation of critique with the secular and its opposition to religious is untenable, as it has been shown in recent works, so is the enlightenment dualism between heart and reason, mind and body, intellect and affect. And this is my third argument. In Islamic tradition, aql is highly valued. However, it dwells with rather than banishes the cognate notion of qalb, heart as well as revelation, ilham. Far from being antagonistic to one another, they cohere in such complex ways that they become often complementary to one another rather than as oppositional. As Abul Kalam Azad read it, the Quran at once addresses the heart, dil, and mind, dimagh, of its reader. In both Arabic and Urdu, instead of splitting them apart, the term qalb encapsulates intellect and feelings, and therefore there is no opposition. Thus viewed, while, Bri while Bridges proposition, and this is the recent book that he wrote, and he says that Islamic intellectual life has been characterized by reason in the service of a non-rational revealed code of conduct. Now, this way of uh, postulating, in my view, is weak primarily because it continues to operate within these dualistic categories of rational versus non-rational. And my final argument is that I make a case for extending the practices of critique from the domain of elite to the ordinary subjects. I suggest that critique should not be the sole property of the salaried intellectuals, and many of us are, but non-intellectuals too enact and participate in the work of critique. And I discuss work of critique in one of the most powerful movements of nonviolence in 20th century, uh, the Khudai Khidmatgar or Red Shirt Movement, uh, led by Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan in what is today uh, Pakistan. And I also discuss everyday critique with illustration from my own field work as well as those of others. Uh, before I switch on to historical and ethnographic materials that I want to present, I will briefly say a few words about different tradition of critique in the Western thought. Uh, because I think that will help us understand this in a much more comprehensive way. So broadly speaking, there are four traditions of critique. First, the Greek. In its earliest Greek usage, the term critique did not have the meaning we assign it today. It originates from the Greek word krino as a verb, which means to differentiate, to judge, to fight, to accuse. And it was mainly used in legal affairs. Crino referred to making an allegation as well as delivering a judgment. <clears throat> in, this in this usage, the word critique 
did not aspire to conquer universal truth, but to resolve particular crises justly within a particular way of life. And this is, uh, I primarily draw on the works of uh, German historian of ideas, uh, Reinhard Koschelek, and the commentary uh, on his work by Talal Asad. Thus, in 17th century, critique meant objective evaluation, particularly of ancient text, but also of literature and art. When the philological method was extended to holy scripture, critique, it was also called cr criticism. And here, there was no contradiction between being a Christian and critical. The term to refer to non-believers was criticaster. Of course, I'm not pronouncing all these words uh, correctly. In fact, critique was often then construed as evaluation and interpretation of truth of a scripture. Now, that is one tradition. The second tradition is obviously linked to enlightenment, particularly to Immanuel Kant, who in his famous essay, What is Enlightenment, said that our age is in a special degree the age of criticism, and to criticism everything must submit. So in this essay, Kant described enlightenment as man's release from self-incurred tutelage, and the freedom to make public one's use of reason at every point. Now Kant's essay is primarily concerned with religious Europe of his time, where he found men not using their own reason and submitting themselves to the tutelage of priest, or what he calls outside directions. His age, being the age of criticism, everything, notably religion, must submit to crit critique and reason. Here, religion appears as obverse of reason. In the hands of Kant, critique became the process of epistemological self-correction by a strict reference to established rational limits and fixed boundary between private faith and public re reason. Critique got intimately intertwined with progress of rational sciences. So that is the second uh, tradition of critique. The third one is linked to Marxism which was later on embraced in many important ways by Frankfurt School. Now, in this tradition, critique becomes synonymous with, for lack of a better term, uh, critique was coterminous with unmasking. So unmasking, the hidden dehumanization of capitalism, including religion, and it was geared towards showing the contradiction of capitalist social order with a view to charting the path of emancipation. In sociology, Pierre Bourdieu practiced critique precisely in this sense. And the latest book by Luke Boltanski, which is called On Critique, is, is a reworked proposition precisely in that tradition. Now, the final and fourth tradition of critique in the Western social sciences is linked to the discipline that I practice, namely anthropology. And one example of this critique is the book by Marcus and Fisher called Anthropology as a Cultural Critique. Uh, and their aim was to rehabilitate this promise of anthropology as a cultural critique by which they meant harnessing the portraits of other, culture, other cultures to reflect self-reflectively on our own ways so as to interrogate common sense and make us re-examine our taken for granted assumptions. And to this end, Marcus and Fisher state that the work is work of critique is enacted by 
by the privileged position of the anthropologist, not by the people themselves with whom the anthropologist works. And this is so because anthropologist supposedly travels from one culture to another, whereas the people themselves don't. And the task of cultural critique, as Marcus and Fisher visualized, was and I will quote, to apply both the substantive result and epistemological lesson learned from ethnography abroad to a renewal of critical function of anthropology as it is pursued at home. So here we get this distinction of abroad and at home, uh, which, which is uh, problematic for various reasons, but we will not go into that. Now let me focus very briefly here, what was the method Marcus and Fisher uh, put forward in terms of practicing this art of cultural critique. The method is called defamiliarization, which can happen in two ways. First, defamiliarization by cross-cultural juxtaposition. So an example is Margaret Mead juxtaposing Samoan and American cultures to critique the latter. The second way in which defamiliarization, defamiliarization can be put to use is through epistemological critique. And to this end, they cite the work of Clifford Geard's book uh, by the title of Nagara as an example. And here the idea is that Geard's, by investigating the Balinese politics, he actually offers an epistemological critique of the very ways in which politics or the political has been conceptualized in the dominant Western social sciences. So having presented very briefly these four tradition of critique, now I will switch to the material that I have and relate it to what I have said before. Now, in order to do this, I will focus on Jamaat e Islami and its founder, Abulala Maududi, and various forms of critique that has been made of Jamaat e Islami and Maududi in particular. So, as many of you know, Maududi was born in early 20th century. He died in 1979. Uh, in the US. Uh, he began his career as an Urdu journalist and initially he was associated with Jamiyatul Ulma Hind which was an ally of the Indian National Congress led by Gandhi. Uh, many people do not know that actually he was one of the first person to write the biography of Gandhi which was confiscated by the colonial authorities. So this beginning uh, aside, later on he got disillusioned with the Congress and Jamit ul Hind and he left that alliance and the key turning point in Modudi's career is the 1937 elections which took place for the first time uh, still India under the colonial rule. And as a result of that election, uh, provincial ministries were formed mostly by the Congress party. Now what were the factors that led to his departure from that Congress Jamitul Olmai Hind kind of politics? Uh, his first point was that he found the Congress nationalism highly majoritarian and he presented a very thorough critique of Congress's policy, especially particularly of uh, Jawaharlal Nehru. And some of the points of his critique were, he was saying that Nehru is not flexible enough to contextualize democracy in the Indian context, because we cannot simply implement, as it were, the British style democracy to a social formation like India, which is very different, primarily in terms of religious diversities. So at that time, in the wake of the 1937 
Congress ministry's formation, several issues had come, like what is going to be the national language of India in a schools, uh, what would be the national anthem, uh, the dress, uh, the whole idea of a national curriculum. Modudi's basic point was that Muslims were getting marginalized and Congress was not practicing secularism in the true sense of the term. So anyway, this is uh, a brief uh, view of his politics before he turned to Islamism. And in 1941, he founded this organization or party called Jamaat Islami. And the goal of this party was to establish an Islamic state. The term used in Urdu is Hukumat e Lahia. Now, from this time, there is a significant shift in his politics and in his ideology. Modudi was critical of both the Indian National Congress as well as the Muslim League, which was the main party uh, speaking in the name of Muslims. In his view, both were highly westernized and removed far from what he thought was authentic Islam. So in course of his activism, Modudi generated a huge amount of literature. Before I go to present diverse critique of Modudi by other Islamic actors, let me sta state that it would be wrong to assume that Modudi's own reading of Islam was less than critical. Indeed, his own presentation of Islam was a thorough critique of Muslim traditions and movements present then. And I will give you uh, a slightly long quote of Modudi. It is an auto autobiographical quote. Uh, what is interesting about Modudi that he presented Islam as an alternative, not in relation to other religious traditions, but in relation to capitalism and socialism. And these were the two dominant ideologies at that time. And against the popular perception, he was highly critical of what he received from the society and from, from his elders. For him, faith was not an issue of inheritance. It was an issue of individual choice. So I will give you this, uh, this long quote to make sense of his view. He says, and I quote, I hold such views about Islam not because I'm born in a Muslim family and thus nurse a favorable attitude which is inborn towards Islam. I had no attraction for that Islam which I found in the immediate Muslim society. After acquiring the capacity for critique and research, tanqeed and tahqeed, so the word in Urdu and Arabic uh, for critique is tanqeed. So he says, after acquiring this capacity for critique and research, the first thing which I did was to throw off the belt of the spiritless religiosity which I had inherited. So I'm, I'm doing a translation which I'm not sure if, uh, if it is 100% accurate. He uses the term in Urdu which is called qallada. I threw off the qallada. Now qallada, historically speaking, uh, in the pre-modern times, it is like a belt which was put around the neck of a slave and the animals as a mark of identification. So when he says that I throw off the qallada, it is a critique of the established tradition. In fact, uh, linguistically speaking, there is uh, the word taqlid, which means imitation, and qallada, they have a common root. Okay, so the point I'm trying to make is that <clears throat> how he was critical of, of the established tradition. So he goes on, if Islam was the name of that religion which is prevalent among Muslims now, then I would have joined the groups of apostates and the irreligious. But the thing which prevented me from the path of apostasy, 
or accepting any other worldview and made me a Muslim again, and this is very crucial, was the study of the Quran and the life of the Prophet Muhammad, which made me aware of the real value of humanism. It familiarized me with, the, with that consciousness of liberty, the height of which cannot be grasped by the concept of even the greatest lib liberal and revolutionary of the world. The study of Quran and the Prophet's life made me, presented to me such a map of individual and beautiful life and collective justice that I had never seen before. And this very thing convinced me that this Islamic system is also instituted by that God who has created the earth and heaven with justice, beauty, and truth." End of quote. Now, as you can see, central to Maududi's thought was a thorough critique of taqlid, imitation. He held that Allah sent all his prophets to establish an Islamic state. And he went on to say that many prophets failed in their mission as they could not establish an Islamic state in their own life. And he particularly mentions uh, Jesus, Isa. And this is a view which actually went against the orthodox established view because the idea is that the prophets cannot fail. Now, the constitution of Jamaat, which he uh, established in 1941, expected its members that he or she, and I quote, doesn't make anyone accept Allah's prophet Muhammad as the yard stick of truth. A member of Jamaat doesn't consider anyone above critique and is not engaged in the mental enslavement of anyone. So these were three attributes of, of a member. Modudi critique thus not only established sanctified authorities of his time, but also the companions of the Prophet Sahaba. He held, for example, that Hazrat Usman, the third caliph, did not have the perfect Islamic merits and qualities of being a ruler. Now, let me shift to some uh, illustration of the critique of Maududi, which was presented by a host of Islamic actors, but I will limit myself here to the ones who joined Jamaat and later on left. And my purpose here is to show how critique actually works in practice, its modalities, its function, and so on and so forth. So uh, one of the major critiques of Maududis and his interpretation of Islam was given by Wahiduddin Khan and, and, and his, his living person. He joined Jamaat in 1947, but in the early 60s he resigned, saying that he found Maududi's interpretation un-Islamic. And after his resignation, he published <coughs> his critique, which is called Tabir ki Galti, Folly of Interpretation. Before I present his critique of Maududi, I think it is very important to, to uh, get a sense of what he means by critique itself, or how he views it. So for him, actually Quran is, Quran is the source of inspiration for critique. So quoting Surah Sajda from the Quran, and its interpretation by Abdullah ibn Abbas, he says that Quran offers two modes of expression, tanqeed, which is critique, and the other term is taib, which is from the Urdu word ayb, which means finding fault. So in his view, tanqeed, which is critique, it means rejecting a standpoint in the light of cogent arguments Whereas taib means finding faults and leveling allegation. The way of critique, tanqeed, he goes on, is an Islamic way, based on argument and evidence. Dalail o Brahim, everyone has the right to analyze a particular thought, 
the way of Taib finding faults is an Islamic. Now, with this framework and by outlining his source of inspiration, then Khan argues that how Maududi's understanding of Islam is incorrect. So contra Maududi, he says that the pursuit of power is not the central message of Islam. Its message is to purify the soul, generate piety, so as to win the favor of Allah, to lead an eternal life after death, Akhira. By making the state central to his thought, Maududi had, in Khan's view, injured Islam, Majruh. At few places, he accepts the importance of the state due to external Kharji factors, but he asserts that a state is an additional, not central feature of Islam. To Khan, Allah bestows power on whoever he wishes. Thus, being endowed with the power is a gift of God. It is not the mission of Muslims as an ummah or as a, as a community. Now, let me shift to another critique uh, by Abul Hassan Ali Nadvi. He is popularly known in India as Ali Mia. <clears throat> he died in 1999, but he was one of the early members who had joined Jamaat Islami in 1941 when it was established. And he, later on, he became a major figure of Nadwatul Ulama, which is a famous madrasa in Lucknow. Uh, Nadvi published his critique in 1978 and sent a copy of his book to Maududi who replied, I have never considered myself above critique, nor do I take it in a bad spirit. But what I want to highlight here is uh, the way in which he construes the very art of critique from an Islamic perspective. So this is how he grounds it. Uh, and I quote, through its long journey in history, thoughts, experiences, istihad, this community, Muslim community, has been immune from lethal accidents and collective deviation primarily because of a scholarly accountability and selfless religious critique. To discontinue it or its prohibition by any group or a school of thought is dangerous. What the Arab poets of Hamasa said centuries ago remains true even to this day. In friendly critique and complaints lies the secret of life of nations." End of quote. Now, believing that critique and accountability are universal rights, Nadvi goes on to say that there are several modes of critique. So he says that in Urdu, the term he uses is that sehatmand critique, healthy critique as opposed to unhealthy critique. Then he goes on to describe that there is just critique and then the unjust critique. He also talks about the style of critique. So what is the manner in which you write or you speak? So he says that broadly speaking there are two styles of critique. One is combative and another is non-combative. Mujadlana and ghair mujadlana. <coughs> So he calls his, his own style of critique as non-combative, admitting that the tone of one of his earliest books on Qadiani was combative because, among others, he wrote it while he was still very young. So according to Nadvi, critique is so central to Islam that even Prophet Muhammad was not spared of it. Once, while leading the prayer, which was of four units. The Prophet ended it midway after completing only two units. The companions asked the Prophet if the prayer has been shortened or did you make a mistake? Neither the Prophet nor the companions pre present there <coughs> discouraged this. Rather, they found it beneficial. Likewise, the second Caliph, Umar, not only granted the right to criticize, to every ordinary and disempowered person, but also 
warmly welcomed it. Thus, a common woman had no hesitation to question and reprimand the caliph himself, Omar, during his public address on what she regarded as his utter misjudgment. In the mosque in Medina, a woman disagreed with and questioned Umar's decision to fix a cap on dowry. Umar withdrew his decision in light of woman's Quran-based objection. At, at that point, the caliph remarked, a woman argued with Umar and she won. What is interesting here is not simply the place of critique which Nadvi grounds in Islamic tradition but also in pre-Islamic tradition namely the poetry of Hamasa. So the sharp distinction which many uh, Islamists would make between Jahiliya and Islam uh, it is not it is blurred in Nadvi's case. Now with this outline of critique Nadvi Lai Khan found that Madhudi misinterpreted the meaning of Allah, limiting it with his one of the several features, namely Jalal, glory and majesty, and forgot an equally important feature of Allah, which is Jamal, beauty, compassion. By valorizing the estate, Madhudi downplayed the virtue of, virtue of piety and love to Allah. Prayer to Allah, he said, is in itself an end, not just a means to power, as Madhudi had argued. Contra Madhudi, he found Sufism as an important aspect of Islam. Some of you might know that Madhudi had famously described Sufism as opium. The word he used in Urdu was chunya begam. And, and, and this, of course, uh, is related to Marx's description of, of religion as, as opium, which he extended it in the case of Sufism. Uh, Maybe another five minutes? We started a little late. Uh, so another five minutes? Okay, excellent. So, <coughs> what I've described so far, it is mostly in the realm of uh, textual criticism, in, in, in the form of uh, writings. Uh, now, let me give some illustration from my fieldwork. Uh, two terms, Maruf and Munkar, uh, these are very important terms in the Quran and it has been commented upon widely. And Madhudi also used these terms as a foundation to his theorization, especially about gender and democracy. During my fieldwork in Aligarh, I met a former member of the Jamaat. a former member of Jamaat uh, and at that point of time he was um, 80 years old and he had retired as a reader uh, from Aligarh Muslim University. In 1940 he had heard Modudi make a speech and, in Aligarh and that actually fired him and he joined the Jamaat. But in mid 60s he resigned and there were several reasons why he resigned. Uh, one of uh, the reasons was that he was a graduate of science, uh, chemistry, and he did not endorse Modudi's rejection of Darwin's theory of evolu evolutionism. As a student of science, he thought that this is very much Islamic. So, in Zurti's view, Quran is actually a book of ethics, akhlaq, and justice for all. In contrast, Jamaat had turn it into a book for Muslims as a community. Thus, by backing the Urdu-speaking West Pakistan against the Bengali-speaking East Pakistan in the 1971 war, in Zurti's narrative, Pakistani Jamaat had degenerated, coming to equate Islam with one language. By ethics, Zurti meant what was morally good. So pivotal is ethics to the Quran that it calls prayer fraud if a prayer doer disregards compassion. And Zurti cited Surah Al Maun, where Allah chides worshippers who are unkind to their fellows. For Zurti, <coughs> Quran is also a call for action, at the heart of which lies this obligation to command Maruf and forbid Munkar.
These words are often taken to mean right and wrong in the popular discussion. In Zurti's reading, they have a different meanings. For him, uh, for something to qualify as maruf, it should be <coughs> a popular and acceptable. It should accord with Allah's feature, sifat, justice and compassion. And finally, it should stand to reason. Further, Zurti stressed that since Islam is a dynamic religion with societal change, the notion of maruf itself would undergo change. And as he considered Islam as a religion for humanity, maruf was beyond religious borders. He held that in the modern West, many ideas of maruf had developed. Human rights, democracy, women's equality. So had the ideas of munkar, colonial loot. It was Muslims' duty, Zurti held, to embrace maruf and shun munkar. He argued that not only did women have the right to vote in election, but they could also become prime minister. So this is a position which Modudi held that women cannot be the head of the state. Uh, and in Modudi's theorization, there was also an intellectual inferiority uh, assigned to, to women. When I was doing this field work uh, in Aligarh, there was, this was a major talk that Arun Dhati Rai had come to uh, make a speech there. So Zurti says that, look, Arundhati Rai is far brighter than many men. So this whole idea of uh, women as intellectually inferior has no basis whatsoever. So again, Kantra Modudi, he said that, uh, that co-education is very much part of the maruf. Uh, Modudi had described co-education uh, as, as poison. So, but Zurti goes on further and he says that, look, in India, they could, women could also uncover their head and wear a half sleeve blouse as both were maruf in the Indian context. To Zurti, Modudi confined women to home because he took an ethnic, not a universal approach to Islam. And he lamented that none had so far understood the Quran because commentators had thus far read the Quran through the hazy lens of distorted hadith and medieval jurisprudence. So um, he was an old person. He could not write. He used to uh, speak and record his, his ideas. And he had employed a few people who would come and, and transcribe it. Now, this is one ethnographic example. Another one, uh, and it is here that I will I'll, I'll, I'll wind up. Uh, another example is uh, this <coughs> war of meaning over the term called Khalifa. So to many Islamists, the term Khalifa is actually very foundational to their theorization about Islam as a political ideology. Uh, in a very simplified way, their formulation would read as follows. The Quran describes human as vice re regent or deputy, Khalifa, of Allah on earth. Since there would be no prophet after Muhammad as vice regents of Allah, Muslims should strive to establish his will on earth, namely an Islamic state. However, is this a proper reading? In his book, titled is man vice regent of God, uh, the picture of which you can see, Sabihuddin Ansari argues to the contrary. He says that God is creator of every particle in the universe. He is capable of extinguishing the whole world in the twinkling of his, in the twinkling of eyes. Therefore, to think of Allah as requiring his deputy to enforce his law is to make a mockery of his omnipotence. This credo, Ansari says, is batil, falsehood. Linguistically, he argues that the root of the word khalifa is khalf, meaning that which follows. Khalf is thus a verse of self, which means that which precedes. To Ansari, in the Quran and Hadith, khalifa is used to mean successor or substitute. To say that human is Allah's Khalifa implies the death or absence of God, who is followed by man. To think so, Ansari argues, is shirk, polytheism. According to Ansari, Ibn Taymiyyah declared that those who use the term Khalifatullah were guilty of committing shirk. 
reversing the Islamist argument, Ansari contends that it is not man who is Allah's Khalifa. Instead, Allah is man's Khalifa. And he cites a hadith, when undertaking a journey, the Prophet used to pray, O Allah, make my journey easy, and in my absence, you are the caretaker, Khalifa of my house. Right? So, <clears throat> so I want to uh, end with uh, one uh, example which is uh, about the beard and how uh, the art of critique as I describe is is presented uh, in the form of you won't have much time we've left for discussion. actually pretty much run out of time yeah. okay keep it to a phrase or two or a sentence that can bring us to the end uh, okay so <coughs> uh, briefly speaking um, in my field work, I was, I was looking at this whole issue of what it means for Muslims to have beard and, 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 and the different uh, ways in which beard has been uh, looked at. Uh, so how this beard, which is an external sign, is also related to the interiority of the self and the ways in which it is informed by certain notion of Islamic piety or lack thereof. Uh, so, since we are running out of time, I will just give a quote which is not from my own field work but from the field work uh, in Chitral done by Magnus uh, Marsden, who did a wonderful book. Uh, and here uh, he is quoting a person who is uh, barely educated. So, this is from Pakistan. And he says, My philosophy is my heart. There are two things. One is a believer, Mormon, who believes that God watches him 24 hours a day. The other is a Muslim, a liar, who believes by tongue only. They pray and have beards just to show things to other people. They are ready to eat bribes. In Pakistan, there are many, there are many Muslims, but no believers. And this is the final sentence, okay? <laughs> Now, what happens when uh, somebody reads a good critique? In the words of Isra Ahmed, a critique of Pakistani Jamaat, he says that, and this is his, his comment on, on a critique by, by another person, he says that the criti critique by name Siddiqui in the journal chirag is sarcastic, personalized, and hence against the teaching of Islam. The same name Siddiqui, however, writes such wonderful and comprehensive critique in another journal, Tarjaman al-Quran, that my lips begin to sing prayers of goodness for the author. So that is where I will stop. Uh, and I'm curious to have your views. Thanks. So we have a little bit of time left for questions. Um, Questions, comments? Then we went on to a description of four kinds of critique, if I remember correctly, which made me expect that we will then turn to examples from the Islamic world of critiques which would be then placed within those four categories to say in the Islamic world, there is an example of type 1, and this is an example of type 2, and this is an example of type 3. But I, uh, that didn't happen. We went on to <coughs> something which we call critique, but which I might very easily simply call dissent. And uh, you know, dissent in Islam. 
would be very apt title for the third part and nobody would have any quarrel with it. But the kind of critique that Kant and others have been mentioned is not so much. I would ex I expected that some something of that nature you would present, but you didn't. So dissent we can have, and we always had dissent. Luckily, we are not killing each other in the you know in the dissent. Like the Kharijis uh, were killed, they dissented. So we have you know gone up further. Uh, I mean. Uh, Ziaul Haq, of course, brought back lashing and whipping to some extent. Uh, even if the, but there was no even the Mia, unfortunately. The, uh, but so I'm, I'm, I'm really at a loss, you know, what you're fighting against. And, uh, and do you make any distinction between critique and dissent? I mean, we have no historical criticism of the Quran of the kind that happens uh, in, in the West. Uh, so what makes you say that it is not a critique but dissent? Well, the, uh, dissent is, I mean, you have been using the word critique. You did not use the word dissent with reference to the four examples. Okay. You, you, you constantly use the word critique. Yes. Uh, and I'm simply calling it, this is dissenting. That, uh, uh, Abu Lala Maududi is descending and uh, 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 Ali Mia is descending from him and Bahiruddin is descending. Right, I, I understand. Uh, Maududi is descending with himself and he goes on to support Fatma Jinnah for in the election. So, you know, that that has been going on all the time. Yeah, so... But uh, there is no real critique of religion as such. Not even to the, to the extent that I think was initiated by Charag Ali and Sayyid Ahmed. <coughs> Look, I mean, <coughs> um, back to your first part of, of, of this statement. I was very explicit in the very beginning that I'm not going to make a conclusion. What I was trying to do is to give an outline of different traditions of critique in social science and, and, and Western tradition. And I, so my, my description of these four traditions, they were simply representative. They are not exhaustive, right? There could be other ways of, of, of situating that critique. But my sense is that you have a very particular idea of what critique is. And that no, is a very... I don't have any. I'm simply saying that you chose the word critique. I'm using the word dissent. Would you accept that? As this, is a, this was a talk about dissent in Islam? Uh, because that would be based on the idea that, I mean, this is actually what you were saying if you read this uh, book uh, called Debating Muslims yes, long by, back, by, yes, by yes. Fisher and Abdi. Oh, yeah. So they also don't, they use the term debate and they're very explicit that it is not a critique. And that, in my view, is simply based on the idea that you have a very particular notion of what gets qualified as critique. So the idea is, I mean, if you, if, 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 so, so since people, a, as long as they, or as long as the they, Western interpretation of the word critique and there is the Islamic interpretation of the word. No, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. But what I, all I'm saying is that to assume, as the dominant Enlightenment notion has it, that critique is necessarily a critique of religion, is not always the case. No, no, no. Th there are there are critique within religion and critique from religion as well. So it is because of this assumption that Fisher and Abdi, they would say that no, what you have is debate. And you are saying that no, it is basically decent but not critique. Because we have a solid idea of what critique qualifies. Uh, if I might I'll piggyback on that for a second, I'd like sure. you to say a little bit more of what your, through your work, um, as opposed to maybe through your, the framework, through your work, do you have a, are you operating with um, a kind of emergent notion of, do you have a theory of critique? In other words, the very fact that critique is really the object of your inquiry here um, says that it's doing, you wanted to do some kind of significant work for you. And then you point to these traditions where it does do that kind of a work, right? So 
for Kant, for instance, I, I was going to ask you that for Kant, imminent and transcendental critique are both, they're different enterprises, but they're related enterprises in the sense that an imminent critique is one in which um, in its kind of situatedness, you also chart the limits of what you can possibly know, given the kind of embeddedness of that way of knowing, right? And so it is, and that in the Frankfurt School tradition then gets turned into an account of the contradictions of that embedded you know, systematic way of being in the world. But the contradiction itself is not you know, the kind of unveiling, as you say, right? is really a way of charting the kind of limits of what one can possibly know, right? um, which is also to say what, what one cannot know, what one cannot kind of claim transcendentally. Um, and so critique does a certain kind of work there, that there, it is separate, it is different from kind of, that there are separate traditions of reasoning and they don't all get you to the same place. right? Um, so I'm wondering, similarly, whether you have a kind of, in the you know, um, ethnographic and historical materials that you deal with, do you have a theory of critique that you could explain to us why this is critique as opposed to debate or dissent? What work is this doing that qualifies it to be critique? Because these other people, whether it's Adorno or Kant, <coughs> had a sense of what critique is separate from, say, um, mm. debate or argument. At a stake here, um, <coughs> I'm not sure in what sense we're using imminent and transcendental. There are uh, different uh, usage of this term. The sense in which I'm using is uh, in the dialectic of enlightenment, uh, there is a revealing sentence that reason has gone unreasonable. Right? So the promise is to rehabilitate the true reason against the reason of fascism, which was very much a, uh, a project of, of, of reason. So what, what is a, at a stake here is that one form of reason is pitted against another form of reason, but it operates within the realm of reason. Right? So, so immanent here, uh, the term immanent and transcendental they themselves are not something fixed. So what I was trying to do here, uh, by the example of Abul Hasan Ali Nadvi, when he's making a reference to pre-Islamic Jahliya poetry, Hamasa, right? In many uh, discourses of other kinds, this would be conceived as something which is not internal to Islam. It is something which is transcendental because it belongs to pre-Islamic time, right? So the very notion that what gets uh, qualified and defined as internal or external, transcendental or imminent, that in itself is subject to the field that is informed by not simply religious factors, but a host of other factors, including, um, including um, the maintenance of, of, of boundary of what constitutes an inside and outside. So here I'm very much like, a very anthropological, uh, basic anthropological wisdom, which, which is from Evans Pritchard in the Newers, right? That it is the context and, and, and the network of actors which goes into the definition of what is inside and outside. Your second point, I think, uh, to conceive of critique, right? primarily for Kant as I understand it, and we, we can have discussion about it. I think uh, this conceptualization of reason as something which is essentially uh, opposed to the religious mode of argu argumentation of his time, right? This doesn't work in other traditions. So I'm not sure if I'm trying to develop a universal theory, which in any case is 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 uh, from the framework that I follow here, is is not a possible thing because there are different diverse ways of critiquing, critiquing, and to to conceptualize a theory of critique uh, in a in a general way is 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 not the task that I'm uh, I'm, I'm I'm pursuing. Sure, uh, but what I'm um, <coughs> they don't mean to monopolize the conversation, so feel free to. Let me know if there are other questions. But 
Uh, what I'm trying to say is that, at least in the kind of modern, you know, from the Enlightenment onwards, right, the critique has something to do with exposing, to show us something that is, that we are so embedded within that we cannot actually see it. And so it, as a um, scholarly or, you know, about to say it as a critical right, um, activity, it looks different than, say, other forms of accounting for oneself or accounting for one's like? scholarly terrain. That, that it doesn't mean the same thing as any kind of, you know, um, oppositional work or any kind of you know, disagreement. And so, in the debates that you are following. What exactly gets exposed or revealed that otherwise, without that kind of scholarly work, would would not exist, would remain hidden? Right? Is there something similar going on? What makes yeah. something? I mean, it, it's another way of saying what makes something critique and not debate. <coughs> What's at stake in that distinction? I mean, if you go by Fisher and Abdi, so their formulation is that for something to qualify as really critical, because you know he's uh, dealing with his materials from Iran. So you have these religious actors, they go to madrasas, so they still operate you know, within the realm of revelation. So therefore, they cannot qualify as work of critique because the reference point continues to be religion. And therefore, he calls it debate, not critique. Okay, my basic idea is that this assumption itself needs to be interrogated because to say that for something to qualify as critique, it must necessarily uh, be against religion and therefore it becomes a work of critique. Otherwise, it is either dissent or debate or whatever. You know, so such kind of formulation you also have in John Bowen's book on Indonesia, where he, he, he uh, does an ethnography of, of geo community. So he talks to these intellectuals, but also ordinary people, right? And he comes up with the same formulation that this is basically internal discussion, but not the work of critique. And my basic point is that uh, the usage of these terms like debate, dissent, discussion assumes that there is an essential notion of critique especially when it comes to the issue of religion. And what I'm trying to do is to interrogate that. Uh, and I do not necessarily think that for something to qualify as critique, especially in the field of religion, it has to be necessarily against religion itself. Because in any case, I do not think that the sharp distinction between religion and non-religion is tenable to, 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 to pursue. Others want to jump in? That being the case, then the critique would be of no meaning because critique is primarily to, it's a kind of, I'm not using the word liberal or progress, but you know, in just dictionary sense that when you critique something, when you critique a tradition, you have in mind the, in fact, the idea of broadening something which is to the benefits of the larger yes. community and it is more integrative instead of being exclusionary. But this critique, whether it is Abulala Maududi or uh, Alimia or Sabihuddin Ansari or even Surti. Surti in a way, I would say. But you know, I would, but I haven't of course read Surti. But all the books that I have read, which of course certainly in a way to use the Urdu term is Tanqeed. But it, this Tanqeed takes us nowhere because the reference point is Quran. Eventually reference point is Quran. I'm not suggesting that you think beyond Quran, but Quran in the very sense that it has been read throughout the 1000 years that we have. That is the problem. You know, Alimia, if I go to Alimia and if I say that this is Sufism, he would not accept me. Alimia's Sufism is Sayyid Ahmad Shahid Sufism. But my Sufism, for instance, is Shishti Sufism of 16th <coughs> century. When I published, in fact, that was not so open. When I published an article in one of the 
In fact, some of my friends published, reprinted my article on Sufism. And at that time, of course, I did not even read Sufism to that extent. And everybody said that, who is the writer of this? This is not Sufism. This is not Islam. Then he was told that the person who has written his, himself is a theologian, because I had read theology. Right. Only then he kept quiet. So that is the problem. So I don't think that there is anywhere, ex except, of course, you can say that Islamic society, the Muslim ulama, the Muslim community is also tolerant. It would tolerate dissent. It will tolerate, it will allow some sort of debate. But eventually, who is, what is blasphemy would remain where it is, where it was rather, even if you go to the Mothezarites. Well, I think that is my problem. In fact, as a member of the community. Right. Uh, what is interesting in your comment when At best I would think that you are giving something of course I would have loved in fact if you had given much more these empirical your own ethnographic details At best I would think that yes, there are some of the things which are new which I hadn't read But it takes me nowhere. I feel that it hasn't taken me anywhere So I think this last comment in itself is interesting when you say that it takes me nowhere You have certain assumption that it should take us somewhere now it is better to talk about what is that assumption? That assumption is that if I live here, and supposing if I eat pork, and if I drink wine, I should feel it still I am a Muslim, and I am a good human being, and I am a Muslim. I am giving you example, practical example. But when I, re when I drink wine, every second moment I feel that I should repent, because tomorrow I will be in the life hereafter, and I will be punished for that. That is not something which is still there in your that's the major difference between whether it is a, as a result of critique or as a result of last 300 years of historical development. So that is my problem. I think what is at stake here? That, that problem is, is pointed out by my critique. Right. Now, uh, thank you for that comment. I, I hold that, I mean, if you take this discourse as, as a religious discourse, right? Uh, I do not hold that there is any discourse, whether secular or atheist, there is no s discourse without certain kind of frame of reference. Every discourse, the secular one, also has certain unverifiable assumptions. And it also has what might be described as founding moments, right? And it, is, it has its own sense of what can be said, what cannot be said, what remains hidden, what, what is visible, right? So. I, thought, I, I don't necessarily agree that what you are describing is something which is exclusive to this particular discourse. In secular forms of discourse also, there are things which cannot be crossed, right? So the boundaries, the importance, in fact, I see that the boundaries are much wider and here, and therefore it would claim to be a universal thing. While the boundaries of the things that I am associated with yeah. and that we are discussing, that you have referred to, it still remains very narrow. Yeah, but my point is that <coughs> the boundary is never eternally fixed. Oh, yes, that's true. But the know, boundary keeps... For the last 50 years, the, I've seen that the, the, boundary. The, the, the boundary... The boundary itself is not something which is given, but it is a product of the societal interaction uh, which we as human agents, we constitute and reconstitute, define and redefine. So I'm not saying, uh, I, I, I don't really buy that idea that it is something, boundary maintenance uh, is, is uh, I mean, one of the liberal uh, definition of politics itself, if you go back to uh, Carl Schmitt, uh, liberal politics is basically about setting friends apart from foes. That is also very much uh, uh, a, an act of differentiation of us among them. So it is not something which I necessarily hold that it is exclusive to a particular set of actors. Uh, liberalism also has its own yes. set of maintaining boundary. Can I just say, um, just, all right, so one, just, one final just, question. Yeah, one thing. So um, this reminds me somewhat of like the attempt, like the democratization. So particular relationship to modernity, let's say we can make a comparison, maybe the Pages article, Muddle of Modernity that came out last year. Where Sorry, who was that again? The base, uh, So it's an article Model Modernity, which came out last year. So a lot of this seems to me to be, in what he talks about, this egalitarian, our desire for egalitarianism, this desire for democratization of different terms. And so it seems like part of, this, part of the project is for this democratization of this term. And one point that he makes it with relationship to modernity and the attempt to 
keep pushing back modernity and say like, okay, well these, this was pre-modern, this was early modern, speaks more to our values and our desire for everything to be egalitarian, which doesn't allow us to actually look at the differences. So for example, your comment Margaret Atwood said critique is part of Christianity, but absent from Islam. Well, what is the way in which she is actually using the term and allowing us to actually speak in different understandings of maybe the way in which critique is understood because if we just flatten it out and say all of this is critique, it doesn't allow us to distinguish, but it's okay to, you know, to basically say that these values are important and we want everything to be egalitarian, to, to be democratized, but maybe it doesn't quite work out like that all the time. And so this is just my kind of comment. But, um, democratization as opposed to what? Because if we, if we, if we speak of d democratization, probably you're using in the sense of democratization of authorities or? Of language, of the word. Of language, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, in, 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 in political science, you would use dem democratization as opposed to, it, it assumes certain thing like monopolization against which democratization comes, yeah. right? I, mean, I, I think so, Nisha's article would be helpful to look at it and then tie it into what you're doing, and I think it'll allow you to maybe get at some issues which maybe have been brought up here, that's all. Mm -hmm. Thank, thanks for that session. All right, so with that, uh, please join me in thanking our speaker, and uh, please uh, stick around and join us for some refreshments afterwards.